Good evening, my friends. I am thoroughly pleased to report that after a long stint away from home, I finally returned to my safe house, to my desk and my books and my specimens, where I can finally record in peace for a while. Hmm. It's wonderful to be back. I love the thrill of field work, but I love just as much the calm security of my subterranean lair. Anyway, um, I mentioned in a past recording that during my unceremonious escape from northern Mexico, I was reminded of a case I worked in the late 90s regarding a rash of UFO sightings in the southwestern United States. Well, now that you all understand the basic history of the UFO phenomenon, I believe it is high time that we dive into this mass sighting. On the surface, the event that came to be known as the Phoenix Lights appears to be similar to many other reported UFO sightings. But even so, it is regarded by many to be one of the best pieces of evidence in the entire field of ufology. This is largely due to the fact that the lights were seen by so many people that not only is there ample film evidence, but also a clear timeline that can track the anomalies as they moved across nearly 400 miles in two states. So, let's start at the beginning. It was March 13th, 1997, and though this event is most often associated with Arizona, the first sighting was actually made by a man in Henderson, Nevada, not far from Las Vegas. At around 1855 Pacific Standard Time, this man, who claimed to have been an airline pilot for Continental Airlines, witnessed what he described as a large V or boomerang-shaped object, which he described as comparative in size to a Boeing 747 airliner pass overhead. He reported six lights positioned along the V-shape, running on a southeasterly course out of the northwest. He estimated the object's altitude to be between seven and 10,000 feet, and to move very slowly. However, given evidence which will emerge later, I think it is likely that he was mistaken in his altitude assessment, and that the object must have been flying much higher. When taken on its own, this report doesn't appear all that different from myriad other UFO sightings from all over the world. And it wouldn't be normally. But what would unfold over the next several hours would reveal this sighting to be only the beginning of a much larger event, as the lights witnessed over Henderson would continue on their way. The next report came in at 2015 Mountain Standard Time, when a retired police officer in Paulden, Arizona placed a call to New Fork, the National UFO Reporting Center. He claims to have been driving northward when he spotted a collection of lights in the sky. He then claims to have returned home and used a pair of binoculars to continue watching the lights until they disappeared over the course of several minutes. He described them as being reddish or orange in color, but rather than the solid boomerang that was reported from Henderson, the Paulden report described four lights traveling in tight formation while a fifth trailed behind the rest. Furthermore, the witness said that each individual point in the sky appeared to be formed of two lights each, the pairs being bound tightly together so as to almost form a singular point. This detail will become important later. Traveling on from Paulden, the lights appeared next over Prescott and Prescott Valley at 2017, where yet more witnesses placed calls to relevant authorities. Some of these witnesses claimed that the lights were red or orange like the report from Paulden, while others reported that one or more of them were solid white. One report in particular that was filed to New Fork claimed that the leading light, at the point of the boomerang, shone white, while the rest retained their reddish color. The reports also differed in another key manner. Some claimed that the lights behaved like individual entities, moving on their own through the formation, while others reported that they all seemed to be part of one large object, as the stars were eclipsed by the connective pieces between the lights. But still, the craft was reported as being entirely silent. Shortly thereafter, witnesses traveling along Interstate 17 reported seeing the formation of lights cross over the mountains that separate the Prescott Quad Cities from Greater Phoenix. Staying on its course, the UFO made its approach from the northwest, cutting a track across the city of Phoenix that took it very close to Piestawa Peak, near the middle of the city. 
Very quickly, reports began pouring into New Fork, the police, and even local military bases, beginning with a trio of witnesses north of the city, which claimed to see a massive craft sporting five bright lights pass between two mountain peaks and cross over the city. Another group, positioned at the intersection of Indian School Road and 7th Avenue, reported to see the craft rise over the peak of Camelback Mountain. At this point, the object turned southward and began to cross directly over the city. A summary of the situation from New Fork claims that some witnesses reported a white beam of light shooting downward out of the craft, but as far as I can tell, there are no photographs of this, and the witness testimony is a bit thin. From there, the lights began to dim, making the object less readily visible, but that did not stop two air traffic controllers at Sky Harbor International Airport from spotting the craft alongside a handful of pilots who were on the ground at the time. A single private aircraft on approach to Sky Harbor also called in a report to the control tower. Several years later, Hollywood actor Kurt Russell, who is a licensed pilot, would claim to have been the one to call in this report. On its way out of the city, more witnesses traveling along Interstate 10 saw the craft, with one family who was westbound on the interstate stating that it passed directly over their car and was so large that even traveling at 80 miles per hour in the opposite direction of the craft, they remained beneath it for up to two full minutes. As the craft continued southward toward Tucson and the U.S.-Mexico border, the reports gradually died out. These events would constitute enough of a puzzle on their own, but later that night, one or two hours after the lights disappeared, a new crop of lights appeared over the city. These were red, as some reports of the earlier lights had been, but they did not move in the same manner. These seemed to hover over the city for a period of minutes before they slowly winked out. Since the event, the two crops of lights have come to be known as the first event, referring to the boomerang, and the second event, referring to the stationary lights that appeared afterward. Media coverage was sparse for a few weeks following the event. A few local papers, including Prescott's Daily Courier, reported on the event a few days later, but it was not until ten weeks had passed that USA Today ran an article headlined, Lights, Phone Lines, Light Up Arizona. After this story ran, other mainstream news outlets began to pick up on the case, and before long it became a topic of discussion across the U.S. and the world. What I have just described is a timeline of perhaps the best documented mass UFO sighting that has ever occurred. It is certainly considered by some ufologists to be the most compelling single event in the history of the field. This is due in large part to the excellent documentation that is available, and the veritable bumper crop of witnesses from all walks of life that corroborate the sighting. This stroke of good fortune has given ufologists and other interested parties a wellspring of material to work from when performing analysis, which we will begin ourselves in just a moment. But first, we need to discuss a pair of additional details. First is the duration of the event. To travel from Henderson, Nevada to Paulden, Arizona took the craft approximately 20 minutes. That would mean the craft in question would need to be traveling somewhere in the ballpark of 600 miles per hour. This seems to contradict many of the reports that claim the object or objects traveled slowly and at low altitudes. This is why I mentioned earlier that I believe the original witness in Henderson was mistaken in his altitude assessment. It is my belief that the object was, in fact, moving much faster, but much higher than the majority of witnesses have reported. The second detail is that of a rather mysterious report that was phoned into the National UFO Reporting Center eight hours after the sightings. The report was delivered by a young man who claimed to be an airman stationed at Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix. According to him, two Air Force F-15 fighter jets were scrambled when the lights were first detected over the city, and even that the two jets were successful in intercepting one of the lights. However, this story has never been able to be fully corroborated, but the alleged airman made one more call to New Fork, reporting that he had been reassigned to his station in Greenland, and then he was never heard from again. The existence of these calls is corroborated by New Fork director Peter Davenport, but it's difficult to tell if these calls were genuine or just part of a hoax. It seems clear to me that there was definitely one or more objects in the Arizona sky that March night. There are simply too many witnesses and too much documentation to write this case off as a hallucination. 
The reports are so numerous and spread over such a vast geographical area that there can be no doubt that something was present. But the question remains, what was it? Unfortunately, answers to that question are sparse, but theories are plentiful, many of them falling back on the usual explanations for the UFO phenomena, not least of which being extraterrestrials. Following an inquiry conducted by the Mutual UFO Network, investigator Jim Mann reported that there was no evidence to suggest that the object or objects involved were extraterrestrial in origin, but that the event was certainly bizarre. In short, MUFON was unable to provide any satisfactory explanation for what occurred. Peter Davenport, the aforementioned director of New Fork, on the other hand, while unable to offer up a definitive answer to the question, did state in a summary of the event that the wide discrepancies in the descriptions of the objects suggest that there was not just one, but multiple objects crossing the sky that night. That would certainly help to explain the differing color of the lights across many of the reports, as well as some of the more far-flung sightings to be called in. There were sightings reported from all over the Arizona region that night, some of them quite far from the course followed by the object that passed over Phoenix. However, as I mentioned earlier, I believe that the object or objects that passed over Phoenix may have been flying much higher than most witnesses attested, which may offer an alternative reason for such a broad distribution of sightings. An object riding higher in the sky would be more likely to be spotted from further away. Questions also remain regarding the number and nature of the lights themselves. Some reports suggest that there were one singular object, while others seem to lean more on the idea that each light was an individual craft, free to move on its own. The case presented by Peter Davenport helps to explain this, but another possible solution lies in the illusory contours effect. When presented with a set of unconnected points in a formation, the human brain will often fill in the spaces between them and make them appear to be connected or to form a solid shape. If this is the case, then each light would constitute its own entity, free to move independently of the formation, though the illusory contour effect would make them appear as one when traveling together. That last hypothesis lends credence to the testimony of one witness who emerged after the event took place. Mitch Stanley, an amateur astronomer, was looking at the sky with a Dobbsian telescope at the moment the lights appeared. He reported that when he pointed his telescope at the objects, they appeared to be high-altitude airplanes flying in formation, each equipped with a pair of lights on their ventral surfaces. The use of the telescope would have given Stanley a much closer view than most, though his report is not popular among many of his fellow witnesses. I believe that Stanley's claim is strengthened by the report from Paulden, which stated that each light appeared as though it was made of separate emitters. However, one problem that emerges with Stanley's assertion is that no formations of aircraft were known to have been flying that night. But if one takes on the view that perhaps these aircraft were military or government planes, perhaps of an experimental or secret variety, it's likely that information about the flight would not be made public. It's also intriguing to consider that the Phoenix Lights may have been some kind of military aircraft when considering the report from the alleged airmen stationed at Luke Air Force Base. A related hypothesis also involves secret military operations, but of a different nature. Some have suggested that the entire event may have been orchestrated by the government as a type of experiment to gauge public responses to inexplicable phenomena. This take dovetails rather nicely with the high-altitude aircraft theory, given that if this is the case, then the lights themselves could have been aircraft, or could have been projections of some kind, perhaps disseminated from one hidden aircraft or from some kind of ground assembly. But no matter what generated the lights, this hypothesis explains away many of the problems other explanations have. It takes care of the issue that no aircraft were known to be flying that route that night. It may be expected that the aircraft would show up on radar, but if these were stealth aircraft of some kind, they might not show up at all. If this is the case, then I have to wonder what the experimenters thought about the public's performance. Every scenario I just listed is a possible explanation of the first group of lights, but we have not yet touched on the second group that appeared later. This question does seem to have a clear answer, though it was not revealed immediately at the time. A flight of A-10 Thunderbolt IIs from the Maryland Air National Guard were stationed at Luke Air Force Base at the time for training. 
At around 2100 hours, they began nighttime training exercises, which involved dropping flares over the Barry Goldwater bombing range outside the city. Some have suggested that the A-10s account for the V pattern seen over the city, but the timeline doesn't seem to add up, as the first object not only passed over the city before the A-10s began their training runs, but the boomerang object was also sighted as far north as Henderson and as far south as Tucson before it crossed the border. However, the hovering lights seen thereafter that seemed to fizzle out were almost assuredly the flares dropped by the A-10s. Their sudden disappearance can be accounted for by the flares drifting below the Sierra Estrella mountain range. Shortly after the event, then-Governor Fife Symington III held a press conference where he dramatically declared that he had determined the cause of the lights before one of his staff staggered out onto stage dressed as a bug-eyed alien. From there, the Air Force and the rest of the military has remained largely quiet on the matter, only stating that their official position is that the lights seen were the flares from the Maryland National Guard jets. Some have suggested that the A-10s were only flown that night so as to provide plausible deniability for whatever experiment the military was actually conducting, though there is little evidence to support either side of that argument. However, there is one final intriguing detail that must be mentioned in relation to this case, and it involves Governor Symington. Once his tenure as governor came to an end, he changed his story regarding the lights. No longer was he interested in a cheap laugh to dispel public fears. In fact, in an interview he gave to the Daily Courier, he admitted that he saw the lights himself on March 13th. He went on to confirm that he thinks them to be an unsolved mystery, and claims that he attempted to contact relevant military, police, and National Guard authorities on the matter, but received responses of no comment every time. So, the Phoenix Lights remain an indelible mystery. I personally believe that the high-altitude aircraft explanation is the most likely. Despite the derision among the various witnesses, I believe that Mitch Stanley had the best viewpoint of anyone who saw the lights that night, and that his input should not be sidelined simply because it isn't as sensational as claims of aliens or top-secret technology. As for the work those planes were doing, I can't say. I think it's unlikely that they were a test of new technology, given that they were all but guaranteed to be spotted with their lights shining so brightly. Honestly, I find the social experiment theory to have merit, perhaps more merit than any of the other theories or hypotheses I've come across. But at the end of the day, there is no concrete answer. So all we can do is speculate off of the information that we have. Since 97, Phoenix has very much embraced the event as part of its local lore. There's even a Phoenix Lights music festival that is held in the city every year. And perhaps more pertinent to our purposes, Arizona has remained a hotbed for UFO activity. In fact, Arizona has the highest per capita UFO sighting rate of any state in the Union, and is home to many other alleged UFO sites. Among them is the Dreamy Draw Dam, under which some believe a crashed UFO is hidden, or perhaps being kept for research. One of the most famous alien abduction cases in the world, the case of Travis Walton, is alleged to have occurred in the neighborhood of Snowflake in northern Arizona. And, of course, Flagstaff, Arizona, is home to Lowell Observatory, where Pluto was discovered. Its founder, Percival Lowell, believed that he was able to spot canals on Mars with its telescope, and proposed several methods by which we Terrans could attempt to communicate with our Martian neighbors. Arizona is a very strange place, to say the least. A place where I've spent a good deal of time carrying out investigations of all types, and a corner of the world where we will all be assuredly returning to before long. But until we make our next pilgrimage to the Grand Canyon State, stay tuned, stay vigilant, and man the watch. <laughs>